right now. Tonight, a Bear County grand jury has indicted four people in the murder of a 20 year old man outside of a hookah lounge. According to the DA's office, Nathan Sanchez, Aaron Trevino, Joseph Ortiz and Arturo Reyes have all been indicted on capital murder and aggravated robbery charges. All four men are accused of shooting and killing Takai Michael outside of the Blow Hookah Lounge on Eisenhower Road last May. Police say the group stole Michael's belongings and when he tried to get them back, Sanchez and Trevino allegedly shot him several times. SAPD says surveillance video showed Ortiz using a gun during that robbery, then hours later posted a picture with Michael's necklace on social media. The men are all now awaiting trial. Today, jury selection began right here in Bear County for accused serial killer Juan David Ortiz. The former Border Patrol agent is accused of killing multiple sex workers over a span of a few weeks. Ortiz is also a husband, a father, and a Navy veteran. Tonight, Erica Hernandez gives us a look at the man who will soon stand trial. Laredo is a city of more than 260,000 residents. In this border town, it's common to have customs and border patrol agents living here. Marisa Limon, a veteran journalist from the Telemundo station, spoke to us about life in Laredo. Que aquí como quiera, siempre hemos estado rodeados de agentes fronterizos, es una frontera. Los vemos en los restaurantes, los vemos por todos lados. Es común para nosotros en la frontera convivir con ellos. It was why it was a shock to many when they found out a 10-year veteran of the Border Patrol, an intel supervisor, was the one accused of being a serial killer. Saber que era un agente el que estaba acusado de estos crímenes, yo creo fue lo que más impactó en nuestra comunidad. Ortiz is a Navy veteran, having served for eight years. After leaving the Navy, Ortiz thought about being a cop and was even accepted to the San Antonio Police Academy. But he turned it down after getting a job working for U.S. Customs and Border Protection. While working for the Border Patrol, he was able to obtain a master's degree from St. Mary's University. As for his personal life, Ortiz had a wife and two kids and lived in a quiet subdivision in Laredo. So why are police saying he murdered four women? Ortiz apparently in his taped confession says he wanted to clean the streets of Laredo. He thought he was doing a service by killing them. Ortiz's trial is expected to start November 28th here in Bear County to see the full open court special on Juan David Ortiz. Just scan that QR code with your phone and it'll take you to it. A charter school administrator is looking for the Bear County Sheriff's Office to, quote, make it right after a child abuse case against her was dismissed. Tara Hunter was very publicly arrested back in April for allegedly pushing a five-year-old student into a cabinet. But prosecutors dismissed that case for insufficient evidence back in September. Her charter school network is ready to put her back on a new campus. But Hunter says her name has been smeared and she wants the Bear County Sheriff, who held a press conference about her arrest, to take similar steps to announce the case has been dismissed. The same platform that she smeared my name, the same platform that, that, that she ran it in multiple languages, I want that same, I want you to apologize for what you have done to me. We asked for comment. The sheriff's office sent us this statement saying, quote, at the root of this case is a little boy who sustained real injuries and protecting him is our top priority. We made the decision to arrest based on upon probable cause presented to a judge. The case is still ongoing in our office and we will continue to investigate. We will defer to the district attorney's office as to why they took the actions they did. Tonight, a man is now behind bars for robbing a liquor store and threatening to shoot someone. Bear County jail records show that 37-year-old Clifton Leonard uh, is accused of robbing a twin liquor store and threatening to shoot. The arrest warrant states that someone confronted Leonard about stealing and pushed them. Now, investigators say that Leonard told the person, quote, I am going to get a gun from my car and I'm going to shoot you. The victim identified Leonard in a police lineup. He's now facing a robbery charge and his bond is set at $30,000. They are back and in a big way. Doctors say viruses are striking earlier than usual, catching hospitals and staff off guard. The U.S. Department of Health says over 70% of pediatric hospital beds in the nation right now are full 
due to the spike in respiratory illnesses. Alicia Barrera spoke to two doctors from University Health today on what they're seeing and how they're attributing this increase and what medicines to have in your cabinet. Very congested and very contagious. Doctors now warning cases of the common cold and flu spiking. In the previous two years, we've had almost a non-existent season with respect to, to influenza or flu. And now it's happening months earlier than usual. We really start seeing high numbers of cases late December, January, and even, even into February. Uh, we're seeing those higher numbers uh, now in October, which is extremely early. Dr. Brian Alsip serves as University Health's chief medical officer. He says it's the same case for other infectious diseases, including rhinovirus and RSV. According to the CDC surveillance data that represents about 9% of the total population, cases of RSV tripled over the past two months and are nearing last year's peaks. And I think it's not just a local issue, it's a national issue. A lot of the hospitals are dealing with a high number of pediatric cases. And so we actually have conversations about how to collaborate amongst the hospitals locally. Doctors attribute this in part to people letting their guard down after COVID by no longer wearing masks or not washing their hands as frequently. But they say the first step to staying healthy is prevention. If you have some um, congestion, certainly saline nasal sprays. As it gets winter time, the air gets dry, so your nose patches get, get dry too. After a nasal spray, it, it, you can overuse it. And if you use it too much and then stop, then you're going to have a really runny nose. But if you do get sick, experts warn about medication, specifically combination products, as more often than not, they already include ingredients such as Tylenol and acetaminophen. And you want to be sure that you're not consuming too much. University Health Pharmacy Director Dwayne Davidson says always read the label, especially if you have underlying health conditions. You don't want to exceed more than 3,000 milligrams or 3 grams a day um, for most people, and sometimes even less than that, depending if you have some liver conditions. Doctors say the best form of prevention this season is the flu shot. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. The state of Texas is suing Google over technology. It says stores people's biometric information without their consent. Attorney General Ken Paxton filed the lawsuit in Midland County District Court. The suit claims the tech giant violated the Texas biometric privacy law. They accuse Google of using facial recognition technology in its Google Photos app to identify, categorize and store images of people, even those who did not consent to those actions. Google has not responded to that suit. A Texas woman recovering after she survived being gored by a bison. Rebecca Clark sharing this video on social media in the hopes of educating others. She says she was on a hike earlier this month in Caprock Canyon State Park and Trail when she came upon several bison. Clark tried to slowly walk past them, but then one of them charged her. As she ran, she says the bison gored her and knocked her face first into a thorny mesquite bush. She texted her son and some friends who contacted authorities who were able to rescue her. I thought my back would be broken. It hit me that hard. It hit me that hard. And um, it was probably about 30 minutes into it before I even realized that I was even bleeding. He stood there most of the 50 minutes that I was laying in the bush. So he, he was he was like, don't you get back up. So and I didn't get back up. <laughs> Frightening experience. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department reminds visitors to give bison plenty of space, staying at least 50 yards away. They say if the bison change their behavior, it's best to just leave the area. People living in gray forest, along with some local activists, are concerned about a new subdivision set to be built along the far northwest side. Yeah, the developer submitted an application to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to pump treated wastewater into the Holotus Creek. Camelia Juarez tells us what that means for people who live in that area and for the drinking water of everyone in San Antonio. This was the Holotus Creek last year. Randy Newman, a Gray Forest resident of 40 years, knows its charm. Probably some of the happiest memories I have are as a child swimming in this pristine water. People living in Gray Forest worried their swimming hole could be history if developer Lennar builds 3,000 homes. Lennar sent a permit application to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to build their own wastewater treatment center and pump up to a million gallons of treated wastewater a day 
into Holotus Creek. And it's, uh, we just can't trust that it's going to really get all of the chemicals, all the pharmaceutical products out. That water will run on top of the land and make its way down into the Edwards Aquifer. The Southwest Research Institute did a study on the Holotus Creek in 2020. They found that any wastewater disposal in the Holotus Creek could negatively impact the Edwards Aquifer. The Greater Edwards Aquifer Alliance agrees. We're raising a lot more environmental concerns when it comes towards, you know, recharge rates, pollution entering into our recharge zone, and especially for Edwards Aquifer. Annalisa with the Greater Edwards Aquifer Alliance says the organization has contested the application to TCEQ because the long-term buildup of treated wastewater in our aquifer could be expensive to reverse. It would cost SAWS ratepayers in the billions of dollars to pretreat that water before it's distributed. Appraisal documents show the land has not yet been purchased by Lennar. When asked for comment, Lennar declined. You do it for one developer and then you'll start doing it for everybody. And before you know it, you have irreversible damage to the water system. Camelia Juarez, Kisa 12 News. Let's take a look outside with live cam. It's been a beautiful stretch of days. So will that follow us into the weekend, Adam? You're going to notice a few changes into the weekend, particularly a little extra humidity, especially in the mornings. And that's going to mean some warmer mornings on the way as well. Nothing but sunshine out there and temperatures. Well, 83 officially at the airport after high of 84, 83 in Hondo, Comfort 83 as well in New Braunfels now at 84 degrees. As we go through the evening, just a clear sky out there. Beautiful south wind at 10 miles per hour. You'll notice that breeze periodically up to 15. By 8 o'clock, 74 degrees. 10 o'clock, we're down into the upper 60s. And by midnight, 65. Tomorrow morning, we start the day at 62. Those morning temperatures are on the rise until we get into the middle part of next week. We'll have that fall like feel again. We'll talk more about the next the coming cold front and its rain chances in a bit, Tim. Thank you, Adam. Let's take a quick look at your evening commute this Friday with Traffic Authority. The camera there at I-10 and Probant. Smooth sailing on the one side, a little slow on the other. Two cultures coming together. How a Mexican ofrenda is remembering a beloved San Antonio civil rights leader up next. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez and tonight on the night beat, the first ballots are going to be cast on Monday. So how are people voting in the upcoming election? An expert is going to weigh in on what the latest poll is trying to tell us. Plus, I can't even describe what I felt. Overwhelmed, shocked. Yeah, that woman beat breast cancer and now that survivor is using her experience to help other patients. How she's stepping up to support those who are struggling. Those stories and more tonight on The Night Beat. Thanks, Stephania. It said the Dorothy Collins would have loved it. A Day of the Dead ofrenda honoring the respected educator in the Edgewood School District. She helped desegregate what had been the Joskies department store downtown. Jesse Degollado tells us why the ofrenda for Dorothy Price Collins has added significance. A traditional Mexican ofrenda was being adorned by history students at St. Mary's University outside the San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum. This represents both my cultures. I am African American. I'm also Hispanic American. A symbolic coming together of two cultures embraced by Dorothy Price Collins. And she would be very proud of that because she believed in helping everyone. Color didn't matter to her. As in most ofrendas, each item represents something about the person it honors. Among them, a photo of Collins and her former first grade student at Winston Elementary, the now legendary Gloria Stefan. Back then, Collins was asked why put so much effort helping an immigrant child who didn't speak English. And she said, because this is a child that is working hard to get to a different place than where she's been. The ofrenda also is a tribute to a woman who had stood up to segregation. Protest activities or uh, sit-in activities that, you know, that actually tried to move the needle. And now the ofrenda to Dorothy Price Collins has come to embody her lifelong belief in unity. We are more alike than different. Love you, we remember you. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. 
We are now just a little over a week away from Huertos Fest. This free event begins on October 29th at Hemisphere Park. There will be original artwork there, live music, dancing, and the largest open altar exhibition in San Antonio. Now, if you want to stay home but still enjoy the event, you can catch our primetime special, which will air Sunday, October 3rd from 8 to 10 p.m. on KSAT 12, KSAT.com, and KSAT Plus. You can learn more about Buentos Fest. Just scan this QR code that you see here on your screen. Let's take a live look outside with Sky 12 tonight, flying high above Northwest Vista College for the Halo Vista event. Not quite sure what it is, but it sounds like it's something. It sounds Halloween. like it is seasonal. It is on yes. points for the holiday just around the corner. And I know that it's probably way too early to talk <laughs> about, OK, what's it going to yep. be like on Halloween? So let's talk about the weekend instead. Exactly. I like your style, <laughs> Myra. Yes, let's just focus on the weekend. And you will notice some changes this weekend, especially some warmer mornings and a gusty wind at times out of the south southeast between 20 and 30 miles per hour. So a bit breezy this weekend and warmer. Then we have some rain chances by Monday. I do think we'll see areas of rain at that point developing throughout the day and actually a few cold fronts that we're expecting one Monday and then the other this time next week. So let's talk about this all in terms of rain chances. First of all, we need the rain, of course. Best chance, first cold front on Monday. That's 40%, so scattered activity. And then by this time next week, we've got a shot of some isolated to scattered activity as well. Let's take a look at the big picture. Quite across the state right now, we like the water vapor satellite imagery. Really helps to detect the nuances in the atmosphere and the little swirls and we're watching one that's dropping into the Pacific Northwest and this is going to be a big player in the days ahead. It's going to drive southward and meet up with this upper level swirl that we have in the Pacific just southwest of Los Angeles there. They're going to team up and drop into the southern United States and move across Texas and pick up some moisture and help generate some of the shower activity along with that cold front on Monday. And speaking of moisture, some of the upper level moisture will be coming from what is now Tropical Storm Rosalind. Almost a hurricane. Max sustained winds now at 70 miles per hour, gusting up to 85. And it's likely to become a Category 2 hurricane this weekend and then make landfall somewhere near Puerto Vallarta on Sunday and then quickly dissipate and fall apart as it moves inland, especially over the higher terrain of Mexico. And what's left over will be some moisture aloft for us and a little bit of energy that should help to kickstart some showers into Monday. So let's talk about it. Monday morning, I think we'll wake up to low gray clouds and a few spritzes and sprinkles here and there. Then we get into the afternoon. The cold front moves in better push of support as well and scattered activity, widely separated showers and thunderstorms developing, especially just along that front. I'd be happy to get half an inch out of this system. Uh, there is the possibility of close to an inch within some of the heaviest downpours. I just don't think we're going to have as much rain as we did the previous event where along the Rio Grande we had between three and five inches. This isn't going to be one of those situations, but you know, a little, little bit of rain. We'll take all we can get. 83 right now. Dew point of 49. That's the key. Dew points are down. Yeah, they're still low from our cold front several days ago. Dew points are down and it is feeling crisp outside. That's going to change a little bit this weekend and even into Monday. We'll have these dew points rising into the weekend. You'll mostly notice humidity in the mornings and then Monday is going to be a sticky day before the cold front hits and sweeps away the humidity again by Tuesday of next week. So that'll mean cooler mornings again for the middle part of next week. And we're going to say goodbye to the fall like feel this weekend, but then middle of next week it's back. It's going to return temperatures right now. Some upper 70s in the hill country. Kerrville 79 Las Maples at 78. Seguin now at 83 tomorrow morning right near 60 degrees. So 57 Bulverde and Comfort about 60 on the south side of town at Stinson Airport, Floresville as well. And then by the afternoon, we're soaring into the 80s. Floresville, Pleasanton, 88. I think about 87 officially in town. And as I mentioned, you'll notice that wind of this weekend, both Saturday and Sunday, gusting at times 20 to 30 miles per hour. And then mornings back near 50 by next Wednesday with those highs in the upper 70s. So some bigger changes on the way. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Adam. Larry's got the car all gassed up, ready for another <laughs> Friday night BGC road trip. First stop tonight, Smithson Valley. Yeah, guys, this is a uh, District 12, um, a District 12 5A Division 1 
contest. Sorry, I'm just grooving out to the boy band music going on. What can I say? It's good stuff, right? Hey, it's Bernie Champion at Smithson Valley, and the Rangers are looking to remain undefeated in District 12 5 we win. Plus, in college football, is UTSA North Texas a rivalry game? Coming up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome live to Smithson Valley High School, where tonight the Smithson Valley Rangers will host the Bernie Champion Chargers in a district football contest. Two teams heading in the opposite direction, which is three weeks left in the regular season. So let's start with the Rangers first. They enter red hot as winners of five in a row. For the season, they're six and one overall, four known District 12-5A1. They're tied for first place with the Seguin Matadors, who are also six and one overall and four known district play. The Rangers are dominating in district, outscoring their opponents 100. 167 to 16. Wagner scored 13 of those points. And last week, MacArthur scored the other three. Before that, the Rangers D shut out New Braunfels Canyon and Kyle Lehman in back-to-back -back games. This is the Rangers' first season back in 5A after spending many years in 27-6A facing the likes of Judson, Steele, and Clemens, just to name a few of those awesome programs. Facing great 6A programs is helping the Rangers play some good ball in one of the best 5A districts around. I think they did a great job, especially with our non-district games, having Reagan and all them. I think they prepared us very well for this season. I feel like um, starting off as a, as a team, you know, it's always good to have a good competition. Um, just to, you know, see where you're at, see where you start. And going into this district, I feel like we all have a plan and have standard to play. And uh, playing them last year really did a good job of um, feeling, uh, feeling out where the standard is, the center of play for varsity football. Well, I think any time you go out there, you gain experience. And certainly bumping heads with Steele and Judson and Braunfels, Clemens, guys like that year after year after year. Um, our guys know what it's like to be in a ringer. And uh, this is a different ringer with a different set of people in it. But, uh, uh, you know, we, we're, we haven't had to back up from it. One of those new teams is Bernie Champion. The Chargers are 2-5 and five overall and winless in District 12-5A1 at 0-4. Champion is a great football program, so they're just having a down year. Still, the Chargers, led by quarterback Jordan Ballin, cannot be overlooked. Well, they've got another elusive quarterback. Seems like everybody's got one these days. And, uh, you know, he does a tremendous job uh, throwing and catching, getting the ball out quick. And then when those are taken away, you know, he's uh, shown the ability time and time again to get away, escape, extend the play, and either run for tons of yards or find somebody open deep in the play and uh, make a big play that way. So we've got our hands full containing him. Yeah, they do have a very good quarterback, but um, uh, our D-line and our, our linebackers are we're working really hard to try and keep them in the pocket and keep them in, uh, contained as well as we can and just go in there and do what we have to do. I think they're going to be a great, a great opponent for us, um, but I think if we can continue doing what we're doing, I think we can come out with a win. This is a heavy hitting road trip tonight, folks, with Champion at Smithson Valley, Clemens at New Braunfels, and finally, my pass is at Davenport. Highlights tonight at 10 on the night beat and at biggamecoverage.com. In college football, the stage is all set for UTSA to host North Texas tomorrow, 2.30 in the afternoon at the Alamo Dome. It is the Conference USA game to watch tomorrow. Both teams are 3-0 in Conference USA and looking to derail the other. You know UNT wants to knock off the defending Conference USA champs. Last week, UTSA won at FIU 30-10, while UNT beat La Tech 47-27 to set up this contest. UNT leads this rivalry 5-4, leads this series 5-4, but is this game a rivalry? Rivalry. I wouldn't say a rivalry game. No, we uh, we we attack every week the same. We stack days on days. You know, win the day every day. You know the motto. Uh, I think when we start getting into that game, uh, start thinking too much in our heads. That's when we kind of get off track. So as long as we can look at it as the same, we look at every game, uh, prepare for them, watch film, lock in on our keys. We'll be good. And the Spurs right now, and the Spurs are up 22-13. We'll have highlights for you on the night beat. That's it from Smithson Valley. See you at 10 o'clock from Davenport High School, guys. Be safe in your journeys, Larry. Yeah, I had to check the itinerary there. <laughs> we'll be right back. 
Timing is everything. That's what San Antonio police say when it came to an early morning crash involving a teenager. Yeah, officers found the injured passenger who they say had been left behind at the scene near Loop 1604 in Braun Road. As Katrina Weber tells us, a FaceTime call helped first responders find that crash site. Away from traffic in a dark ditch is where a compact car landed before five this morning. San Antonio police say the teen driver with two teenage passengers was speeding on the Loop 1604 access road near Braun Road. He lost control, rolled over, and went through a chain link fence. I was so scared. I was crying a little bit. Sierra Martinez was not inside this crumbled heap but was on a FaceTime call with her boyfriend who was in the car. You know, when you crash and everything goes forward and like I, I saw them like go forward and then you could hear it like if they hit something. She immediately woke up her mom and rushed to the scene while also calling 911. When officers arrived, they found only one teen still here. He had been thrown from the car. Paramedics rushed him to a hospital. Police say the driver and another passenger, Martinez's boyfriend, climbed out and went home. One of them later went in for medical treatment on his own. I thought he was in there and he was like, you know, dead. Police say there could have been a very different ending to the story. They say the teen who they found here had a bad puncture wound to his back and might not have survived if they hadn't found him in time. One thing that has not ended is the investigation. Police say their traffic team will take over from here and decide what charges, if any, the driver will face. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. A federal judge is temporarily stopping New York from restricting guns in places of worship. The judge struck down a provision of New York's gun law that makes it a felony for someone with a concealed carry license to have a firearm at any place of worship or religious observation. The ruling comes after the Supreme Court's decision last term that changed the framework judges must use to evaluate gun regulations. Justice Clarence Thomas wrote that opinion and said that gun regulations must be justified by demonstrating the law is, quote, consistent with this nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. President Biden today hammering the economic agenda put forth by Republicans, calling it, quote, mega, mega trickle down, end quote. Today, the president touted the plunging federal deficit as evidence that his economic policies are working. We're going from historically strong economic recovery to a steady and stable growth while reducing the deficit. Building an economy where everyone does well, where the poor have a ladder up, the middle class does well, and the wealthy do very well. They're not hurt by it. The president noted the federal deficit went up every year that former President Donald Trump was in office. He claimed if Republicans were in power, they would add $3 trillion to the deficit. Former President Donald Trump's chief strategist, Steve Bannon, sentenced today. It comes after a jury found Bannon guilty of two counts of contempt of Congress. Bannon defied a subpoena from the House Select Committee investigating the deadly January 6th attacks on the Capitol. ABC's M. Wen in Washington with the very latest. One-time advisor to former President Donald Trump, Steve Bannon, sentenced to four months in prison and ordered to pay a fine of $6,500 for two counts of criminal contempt of Congress. I respect uh, the judge. The sentence he came down with today is his decision. I fully respect him and totally respectful of this entire process. The Trump-appointed federal judge agreeing with Bannon that he should not have to serve a sentence while he appeals. A jury this summer finding Bannon guilty for failing to produce a single document and refusing to sit down for a deposition with the House committee investigating the deadly January 6 attack on the Capitol. The panel subpoenaing Bannon last September to find out why he made foretelling comments on his podcast a day before the insurrection. All hell is going to break loose tomorrow. For months, Bannon refused to cooperate, claiming executive privilege despite leaving the White House back in 2017. The committee instead playing audio from Bannon during a public hearing from before the election happened, saying Trump planned to declare victory whether or not he won. He's going to declare victory, but that doesn't mean he's the winner. This afternoon, the January 6th House Select Committee officially subpoenaed former President Donald Trump requesting documents and an in-person deposition for next month. M. Wynn, ABC News, Washington.
After the break, Via's employee art exhibit is back. We'll get a look at some of the artwork and learn more about how it lets employees express themselves. VIA is back with its employee art exhibit for its 10th year. Tiffany Huertas gives us a look at how this exhibit is giving people an opportunity to express themselves and share their talents with the community. I was really initially just going to have the, the luchador with their picture, but I wound up making the backing for it and put them in a case, and that reminded me of uh, when we used, to, my, we used to buy G.I. Joe's. Mario Quintanilla's art piece is on display at the 10th annual VIA Employee Art Exhibit. It's a clay epoxy that uh, I made. Uh, I made them out of a, a two-part epoxy clay that you can mold, and, and, and once you get them molded, you can start painting them. And, and I kind of used it uh, to do my uh, friends from work. Mario is a welder at VIA and says this event is special to him. If I didn't do it here, uh, I think the last time I would do anything like this was be me middle school or finger painting as a kid, you know. So I'm glad that it has it, you know, able to able to come out here and express yourself. VIA's administrative building along Medina Street is filled with paintings, photographs and sculptures, all done by VIA employees and their families. It's a creative outlet for our employees to showcase their talent. This year's entries were judged by local artists and prizes were awarded to participants. The National Arts Program allows for us to provide actual cash prizes to some of the winners of this particular competition. And although the exhibit is on display until today, Mario already has several ideas for next year. I'm looking forward to the challenge. Um, it's, I, and really, I really, uh, the winning is cool, but being able to, the ideas that I'm coming up with in my head and putting them together and actually see them, you know, come into fruition, you know, I'll, I enjoy that as well. That was Tiffany Huertas reporting. Right now, you can nominate your best picks for the best restaurants, chefs, food trucks, and more by going to ksat.com slash best Texas eats. The nomination period for the competition closes tonight at 11.59 p.m. And voting starts on Monday, October 24th at 12 p.m. There are a variety of categories to nominate and vote for including best burgers, best pizza, best coffee, and best Tex-Mex restaurant, and a whole lot more. I must be really hungry because all I can think about is that burger <laughs> in that graphic. It's <laughs> really good. It's dinner time. Also looking good, the weather, beautiful. Yeah, it's been feeling good. That's the nice thing. We finally have the fall-like feel in the air, but it's going to disappear for a few days as we get into the weekend. You'll notice some changes and then early next week it'll reset a little bit and we have some rain to talk about. But first to here and now 83 degrees currently comfortable outside low humidity and by 8 o'clock we're in the mid 70s 10 o'clock 68 degrees just great for Friday night football or any outdoor activities. You'll notice that south wind from time to time more on when you can expect some showers to develop in just a bit. Today is National Mammography Day. Early detection of breast cancer could be the difference between life and death. If you're the right age, the day is a reminder to schedule a mammogram and encourage loved ones to do the same. According to CDC guidance, women 50 to 75 who are at average risk for breast cancer should get a mammogram every other year. Women 40 to 49 should consult their health care provider or doctor on when to begin and how often to get one. National Mammography Day comes during October's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Frito-Lay announced three chip flavors in honor of the FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022 Lay's Adobadas, which features a combination of chili, tomato, lime, and lime. And then there's bacon-wrapped jalapeno chips and wavy carnitas street tacos chips. All three flavors are available nationwide in grocery stores or at snacks.com. Lay's customers can also join the company's Pass the Ball Challenge by scanning the QR code on the back of a chip bag. Someone could even win a trip to the final game. The World Cup starts November 20th and runs through December 18th. And now you have chips to enjoy it with. Yeah, go along with that burger mm -hmm. that you're thinking about. Oh, I'm starving, man. <laughs>
<laughs> Thinking about the weekend, too. Ready to get out and enjoy it, hopefully, Adam. Oh, yeah, there'll be plenty to enjoy. And the mornings may look like they're going to rain a little bit with the low clouds, but unfortunately, we won't see any rain. We're just a lot of sunshine by the midday and afternoon and not as fall like out there. That's for sure. Warmer and even breezy this weekend with increasing humidity. I think you'll especially notice by Sunday. Then that's going to lead to some areas of rain on Monday and even a few cold fronts to talk about, the first of which hits us on Monday. So temperatures will be up and down a bit. Let's talk about the morning temperatures. You know, we've had that cool, crisp fall like feel, which goes away this weekend with mornings in the 60s, even upper 60s on Sunday. Monday morning, we're at 71. That's an indication of the higher humidity. But then mornings are back down to the fall like feel for the middle part of next week. By Wednesday, we're talking morning temperatures, upper 40s to low 50s, and same story into Thursday. So those crisp, cool mornings will be back. You just need to wait till the middle part of next week. And afternoons will be up and down a bit too. We'll look at that in a moment. First, the current temps out there, 80s just about everywhere across the state. Alpine at 76, El Paso 83, Laredo 85, Houston now at 80 degrees. 78 though in Kerrville, Carrizo Springs down to 79 and 83 officially here in San Antonio. For the most part, we're just within a few degrees of 80 at the moment and temperatures falling off pretty quickly this evening and tonight and we'll settle down close to 60 degrees tomorrow morning. 57 Bandera and Bernie, 59 Castroville, Converse about 62. I think downtown San Antonio about 62 degrees in the morning. Then by the afternoon, we're up to 87 Sunday, making it to 88 degrees. The average, by the way, is 80. So we're running above average this weekend. And then Monday's cold front will reset temperatures back into the upper 70s to right near 80 degrees by Tuesday of next week. So with those cooler mornings will come some cooler afternoons as well compared to what we'll have this weekend. And of course, the transition is going to bring with it some areas of scattered rain. That's the big deal. We're watching a few things. A dip in the upper level flow coming into the Pacific Northwest. That energy is already causing widespread precipitation and even higher elevation snow. But also this upper level swirl just southwest of California. That's going to meet up. Those two are going to join, head our way, and help pull a cold front through along with some leftover moisture from what is now tropical storm Roslyn. Max winds at 70 miles per hour, a few gusts up to 85. And this is likely to become a Cat 2 hurricane over the weekend and make landfall somewhere near Puerto Vallarta, Mexico on Sunday. Then the remnants as it gets shredded apart uh, over Mexico, especially the higher terrain, some of the upper level, level moisture will remain and head our way. And that could actually help kickstart a few very light showers Monday morning. But most of our support's going to be coming in from the cold front and that upper level energy from the west. So it basically just expect some scattered areas of rain to develop throughout the day on Monday, but it's not the kind of activity where everybody's going to get hit. And I think the highest rainfall potential is north of San Antonio and our future cast is showing some of the heavier rain generally north of Highway 90. I'd be happy to see a half inch out of this system. I'm not expecting it at my house, but I'd be happy to even get that out of it. So 40% scattered on Monday, then next Friday, basically this time next week, a 30% chance and uh, that's with another cold front. So 62 at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning by noon, we're up to 80 degrees and then that high temperature of 87 later on in the day. Morning clouds, afternoon sun, a bit breezy this weekend. South southeasterly wind generally at 10 to 20 and lower humidity will return again next Tuesday. So when you feel it Sunday, Monday, just know it'll be swept away again. All right. Thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming your way next. It is Friday, October 21st. An update to a story we first brought you earlier this week. We have now learned a San Antonio child psychologist arrested on a child sex abuse charge back in August remained under contract with Child Protective Services until this week. Dr. Timothy Kimball was arrested for indecency with a child by contact back on August 24th, but a letter obtained by KSAT today shows that the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services didn't terminate Kimball until this past Wednesday, a day after KSAT reported on his arrest. DFPS officials said that they would be terminating the contract with Kimball's practice because he failed to report his arrest to the state despite being required to do so. 
Kimball is now free on a $125,000 bond. Take a look at this. A fuel tanker truck exploded in Mexico today. 1,500 people were forced to evacuate in Aguascalientes. First responders say 100 homes and 50 vehicles were affected by the blast. No deaths have been reported so far. And the first day of early voting is Monday and prep work is already underway. This morning, election judges started picking up vote center materials for each of their sites. Registered voters can vote at any polling site during the early voting period or on election day on November 8th. There will be 51 polling places open daily throughout the early voting period. However, the hours may vary. And for a list of operating hours and voting locations, you can go to the Vote 2022 section of KSAT.com. Early voting takes place from October 24th until November 4th. This weekend, a mixture of sun and clouds, breezy and warmer. Not quite as fall like. I mean, Sunday morning, we're talking 68 with noticeable humidity. Highs in the upper 80s. Monday, cloudy, some areas of rain developing, but unfortunately not everybody getting it and then fall like again by next Tuesday. Thank you, Adam, and thank you for watching the news at 6. Hope to see you back here for the night beat tonight at 10. Have a good evening.